We are saved in a world that's lost All our hope rests in your cross God of strength our weakness shows We need you We need you Father Enter this temple Come touch your people We need to be where you are Children as their father washed in pure water we need to be like you are we are searching for your promise we are knocking on your door let your wings cover us with promise for communion, for communion. Father, enter this temple, come touch your people. We need to be where you are. Children living as their father, washed in pure water. your people to be like you are to be where you are Father come touch your people and Father enter this temple come touch your people we need to be where you are Children living as their father Washed in pure water We need to be like you are To be where you are To be like you are To be where you are To be like you are Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, we hope you're staying safe and warm and cozy. And uh, we gather together apart again to practice our faith, and to gather to call to mind who God is, what he is doing in our lives. We gather as this community of faith to listen, to learn, and to give, and to grow, and to go forth and share good news that we have heard today. Let us continue our, our praise this morning, singing all my fountains. Trying desert land, I tell myself keep walking on. Here's something up ahead, water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river carries me on. Let it flow, let it flow. My soul, a well that never will run dry. I've rambled on my own, never believing I would find an everlasting stream. Your river carries me home. Let it flow.
everybody. My name is Jenna. I'm the pastor here at Faith United Methodist Church, and I'm so thrilled uh, to be joining with you in worship this morning. Just a couple of quick announcements as we continue with worship. Uh, the first is that this Wednesday, the 17th, is Ash Wednesday, and it marks the start of the season of Lent. So uh, we're going to have a streamed service at six o'clock. We anticipate the weather is going to be kind of yucky uh, from what we see right now. So we want you to come by the church on the cross side of the building and you can pick up one of these Ash Wednesday little packages. There's enough in here. Uh, each one has some ash in it. And there is enough in there for your whole family. So uh, please don't put water in this because it makes it turn into lye. And that's not good for anybody's skin. But uh, you can pick one of these up and then you can participate in the Ash Wednesday service at home. You can ask your family. You can ask yourself. And um, this is just one way for us to gather together. So you want to be sure that you take the time to come and pick that up uh, here at the church property anytime between now and Wednesday. But the sooner the better. Also, I hope this week in the mail, you got one of these beautiful postcards that has all sorts of information about what's going on in the life of our church. If you didn't get one, that means I don't have your address. So be sure that you send me an email or you can make a comment below or send us a Facebook message and we'll be sure to get you this information and get your address on file. Um, we're so excited about all the stuff that we're gonna kick off during Lent. We've got uh, small group gatherings that are gonna start meeting, uh, one online on Sunday mornings and one in person on Tuesday evenings. We're going to have serving Saturdays where every Saturday during Lent, we're going to have the opportunity to have some kind of service opportunity in the community. So we have um, opportunities with Hearts of, for Homes, with Shiloh Gardens. We'll have some opportunities here at the church. We're going to have a blood drive. Um, and then we also have started a partnership with Love Packs, which is a group that does uh, they give food to students over long holidays, long weekends, and breaks during the school year. And so we are collecting some goods for that. Uh, you can check out our Facebook page. There's all sorts of information about what we need, and you can put that in the big bin on the cross side of the building as well. Uh, and we'll be collecting those through the end of the month. We also are going to have a weekly prayer that will be emailed to you, a prayer and uh, devotion that will be emailed to you, but it's not going to come to you unless you sign up. So for all of these things, you can go to our website, tryfaith.org, and you can find the sign-up sheet for any of those things, and we need you to sign up. You can find more information about that and more and all of these things that are coming up in the life of our church. It's an incredible gift and a privilege to be joined with you in worship this morning. Uh, please be 
sure that you fill out our connection card. You can find the link on our website or in the comments below. And we will keep track that you're here with us today and also make note if there's anything that we can be joining with you in prayer in the days and weeks ahead. Again, it's a gift and privilege to be with you in worship today. Thanks for being with us. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. ways of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come into our homes. Come into our lives. Come into this moment here exactly where we are, how we are, who we are, and make yourself known to us. Make us known by the warmth of your love, the depth of your peace, and the overwhelming reminders that even though we remain separated in so many ways, we are connected by your Holy Spirit now and for all of time. God, we give you thanks for the ways in which you have already entered into our lives. And we pray boldly asking that you continue to do so in big and radical ways in all of our time that is yet to come. God, we know that you are big and bold and radical. 
And God, we also ask that you be small, that you be small enough for us to feel you move in a warm breeze and seeing the wind go through the trees in a moment of peace and calm over a hot cup of coffee or tea. Be small enough that we might be able to grasp your presence in our lives. God, thank you. Move around us, move within us, and lead us each and every day, each and every moment to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And so with the hope of all that is to come, we raise our voices wherever we are, and we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning, we will continue to be uh, working through the end of our sermon series that we've been doing called Why We. And this morning, we're going to be talking about baptism. So we are going to go to uh, one of the many passages about baptism in the book of Acts, chapter 10. Hear now these words. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on everyone who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished by the gift of the Holy Spirit that it had been poured out even on the Gentiles. They heard him speaking in other languages and praising God. Peter asked, these people have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Surely no one can stop them from being baptized with water, can they? He directed that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they invited Peter to stay for several days. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, when we talk about baptism in the United Methodist Church, if you have been a United Methodist for your whole life like I have, um, I don't have recollection of my own baptism. That happened when I was very, very young, but I do have recollection of many baptisms of many people since then. Um, I remember my first baptism that I performed as a, a clergy person and the overwhelming feeling that comes with that. But I realized as we've been talking about some of the pillars of our tradition, why it is that we do some of the things that we do, why do we choose to behave and believe in the ways that we have chosen to believe and behave, um, I realized that baptism was perhaps one of the most mysterious ways that we choose to be together of all of them. We take communion together regularly, and so it almost feels like that's more familiar to us. Baptism isn't necessarily something that happens every week or even every month like the Eucharist does. And so I really felt like there was a great deal of information that we could share together this morning to get a pretty good, um, a more robust understanding of why it is that we as faithful people choose to baptize and be baptized. Um, now, like communion, baptism is one of those things that like can get a little hairy. Uh, it's also one of those things, last week we talked about communion as being something that split the church several times, and baptism is no different. Uh, in fact, in the United Methodist Church, there is actually like entire books just about baptism, because when you line United Methodist baptism up with all the other different kinds of baptism that you'll find across the board in other denominations, um, there are so many intricacies that are just like barely different enough 
uh, barely changed enough that sometimes it's difficult to keep it all straight, especially if you weren't raised in a Methodist home. So um, baptism is like this very diverse practice denominationally. And we really kind of get what we have in baptism today back from a lot of the teaching around the the lens that we get most of our theology, which is through the lens of John Wesley's teaching. He's kind of the guy who started the, the Methodist movement back so long ago. And uh, Wesley's understanding of baptism actually came from his Anglican heritage. So Wesley was an Anglican back uh, in Great Britain, back in his day. And when he moved to the Americas, he really took a lot of that old practice with him and kept as much of that intact as he could. And he used this phrase that I think is really interesting. He talked about baptism as, quote, not essential or sufficient for salvation, end quote, but an ordinary means of applying the benefits of the work of Christ to our own life. So for John Wesley, baptism was important, but it was part of the whole of our shared life together. So baptism alone wasn't enough to like get you to the glory land in the end, but baptism was one part of a great host and chain of events that happened to help bring us into this faithful existence in the life of the church. And really he kind of understood baptism as part of a twofold process. So for Wesley, baptism was the first step of rebirth. So you would be um, baptized really as an infant first for this spiritual rebirth. And then it was accompanied by a second act that would be a commitment to Christ by the baptized person later on. And so it really, what it required this two steps, one in which the guardians of a child baptized an infant with the promise to raise them in the life of the church, to show them the love of God and then lead them to be able to make their own decision for Christ later on in their life. So this is really different than a lot of other traditions. Um, Not everyone does uh, infant baptism, but the United Methodist Church has really clung to that as a hallmark of our theological tradition and the way that we understand that God's grace is so big and so wide and so vast that you don't have to understand it in order for baptism to be good and valid and important and meaningful. So baptism in the United Methodist Church then is one of two sacraments. Last week we talked about communion or Eucharist or the Last Supper, and that is the first of the two sacraments, and baptism is the other. And they're kind of held above a lot of the other means of grace that we understand in our own tradition. So uh, the crazy thing about the United Methodist Church is that in the spectrum of UMCs around the world, you're going to see a lot of different ways that people baptize. So uh, if you have seen a baptism here or like in the church that I grew up in, you would notice that baptism is more of like a sprinkling. You kind of, the pastor will dip their hand in and kind of drizzle the water on you. Um, there are some United Methodist churches where they hold your head over the baptismal bowl and they pour water over your head. Um, you'll even find some United Methodist churches that do the full body immersion like you'll see in other traditions. That's not quite as common just because most of our spaces aren't built for that necessarily. Uh, but we, there are all of these ways in which you can baptize And it really is given in a lot of different ways and to a lot of different people and places and expressions uh, because of this kind of mindset that we have really around the open table. And so the United Methodist Church actually accepts baptisms from all kinds of denominations and practices as good and valid and meaningful and real and authentic. It doesn't just have to be one way for God to work. We really kind of understand this big umbrella approach that says, oh, you were baptized once before when you were a kid? That sounds great. Let's count that. And we're able to move forward from that place instead of trying to decide whether or not what happened to you in a previous life or a different phase of life 
whether or not that counted based on the way that it happened. So um, we practice infant baptism and not dedication, which is really just um, some nuance of language. But we really believe that infants should have the whole experience of baptism, that I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the full welcome into the family, all of that stuff. Because we believe, as United Methodists, that God's grace is sufficient enough for baptism to count, even if we can't really understand, even if a, ba- even if a baptized person, infant, can't say any words, we believe that God's grace is sufficient to do the work of baptism in that moment. Now, we do also believe that that really kind of needs to be backed up, you could say, by an act like confirmation in which a person then stands up and chooses the church as their own, um, their faith as their own. But that's really kind of a different thing. So when we talk about baptism, then, it's important for us to think about um, that we do baptisms not because we have to and not just because it's tradition, but because we believe that something happens in the act of baptism, that baptism changes things. So when you think about what baptism does, a really easy way for us to kind of process what baptism does and why we do it is to think about the different things that water does in a daily life. So we can talk about that water cleans, it nourishes, it brings new life, it ushers in new growth. It's necessary for all of these different things. It has momentum. It can kind of bring things along with us. It changes and it moves and it flows. And really, we believe that baptism does the same thing, that the water and the Holy Spirit in baptism work together in the moment to do all of those things that water usually does for the work of those baptized. So we believe in baptism that a person is cleansed that their souls are nourished, that they are ushered into a new life, that God will bring about new growth for them, that God will move and shake and change and mold and flow, that all of those things are done by the Holy Spirit in the act of baptism. Now, it's important for us to know that in baptism, um, Yes, we believe that an ordained clergy person, an elder in the UMC, needs to do baptism. Um, But not because they have lightning bolts in their fingertips or because, like, magically the world moves and shakes because the right person says the right words. Um, It's mostly just about training and getting, you know, some of the words right. But we believe that the pastor in that moment is just a vessel that, that God is actually doing the action. Not the pastor herself or himself, but that God is actually the one in the moment blessing the water and bringing about new life and cleansing and redeeming and all of these wonderful things. So in the act of baptism, then, we believe that a person is baptized into a new family of faith. And this in, uh, the, the movement in baptism actually includes like this gorgeous covenant about family and community, about faith and justice and repentance, about being part of something bigger than yourself. So baptism isn't just something that happens to an individual, but baptism is something that when it's done to an individual affects the entire community and how we live together and move together and grow together and nurture together. It's for everybody who's present. People who have been members of a church for forever, people who just walked in the door for the first time. The baptism of any person is for all people. It's a moment in which we ask for forgiveness of sins. We initiate ourselves and the lives of others into the life of covenant together. We start this new life of faith and action. I think it's really important because We believe that baptism does the same thing at any age. So if you weren't baptized as an infant and you are baptized later in life as an adult, um, we believe that the same kind of things happen. Now, in a lot of traditions, they practice this thing um, that a lot of places call believer's baptism, which means that after what people call... um, The age of understanding or the age of reason, which in a lot of traditions is like seven or eight, um, that 
that in other traditions is when they say, you're old enough that you can choose to be baptized on your own. For us in the United Methodist Church, we really have just decided together that that isn't necessary in the same way because in the United St- in the UMC, uh, we believe in this heavy dose of grace and mystery. That, that even if you're seven or eight or 52 and you choose to be baptized, there's no way that we can fully reason or understand what's happening to us in that moment. That the age of understanding for us is really kind of lost in translation because there's no way that any of us will understand exactly what is happening at any given moment. The best that we can do is lean into the mystery that happens and accept this overwhelming grace that we really can't most of the time begin to place. So that's why we're able to lean heavily on infant baptism because we believe that mystery and grace and the Holy Spirit are so big and so vast and so all-inclusive that God works even if we have no idea how or why. So this is why only one baptism in the United Methodist Church is necessary and why we accept baptism from other traditions. This is actually probably the question that I get most around baptism. It's that a person gets baptized when they're a baby and then in adulthood they come to a new understanding of who God is and how God works and they come to me and they say, you know, Pastor Jenna, I really want to be baptized again. And that's really not something that we do because we believe that your first baptism was so big and so great and so robust and so all-encompassing with love and grace and the movement of the Holy Spirit and the cleansing of the water and redeeming of love and life in your life that you only have to do it once. The first time was not just enough, but it was better than enough. It was all that we need. So I think then it, it's really important for us to, uh, to uh, talk about the big question of why. Why in this day and age should we even still do baptism? And it isn't just because your grandparents were baptized and your parents were baptized and you were baptized and so you should probably get your kids done too. And it's not because grandma is so desperate to have your child her grandkid baptized that you just do it to make grandma happy. Although if that's the reason, like that might be good enough, right? Like God is big enough that if that's the case, it's still going to work. But really we baptize because there is something that is bold and brave and beautiful about proclaiming justice and faith. That like we do in baptism. It, we do it because it is our acceptance and desire to know and share Christ. Not just for ourselves, but with everyone that we meet. With our children, with our family, with our um, community of life, right? That it's this acceptance and desire of knowing Christ. And it's because we believe that something gorgeous happens when we choose this act of love and grace. And accept it as gift to us. Like, the thing that happens isn't just this cute picture moment that you get to put on your wall because your kid, you actually got them all dressed up and the curls and the bow and what and the bow tie, you know, whatever it is, right? It's not that. It's because there is this gorgeous mystery that happens that is bigger than what we can understand. And when we get to participate in it, it changes not just our lives, but the lives of everyone around us. And because we believe that there is something more to life than meets the eye. There is something more to life than this existence. And we want to be a part of it. We get to be a part of it. By participating in the act of baptism, not just in our own baptism, but the baptisms of everyone in our community, we are given this incredible gift. The gift of experiencing grace firsthand. The gift of seeing the love and grace of Jesus Christ, not just happening somewhere else, but happening in our midst here today. And we get to have the opportunity to proclaim loudly that this is who we are. This is who we want to be. 
This is who we choose to be. And this is how we choose to share love and grace with the world. By water, with the work of the Spirit, and the community of faith, and all those who choose to know and serve Jesus Christ. I know that was like a lot of information, right, about baptism. But what I think happens when we tie all of that information together is, is it's not just information that's on a page or in a textbook, but it's information that gives life to this practice that we've been watching for centuries happen around us, that we've participated in, and we realize that it is bigger than anything that we've experienced on our own before. And we can perhaps give extra thanks to a God who gives us all things that we have the opportunity to be a part of this holy mystery. Thanks be to God. Uh, one of the ways, you know, that we participate in the life of the church is baptism. And of course, we've got all sorts of other things. We've got communion. We've got prayer. We've got uh, gathering. We've got reading scripture. And all of those things, when taken together, help to change our lives and mold us and shape the way that we interact with the world around us. So many of you have chosen to be molded and shaped by the love and grace of Jesus Christ that you choose to be generous to this church and other organizations. And for that, I am so, so grateful. You continue to help us help our community with the love and grace of Jesus Christ be better, be better fed, be better educated. And um, your financial gifts go to help us play a bigger part in the life of this community in our immediate vicinity. So thank you. If during the next song you'd like to uh, offer a financial gift to the church, you can do so by, you know, writing an old-fashioned check and you can put it in the mail to us. You can uh, go to our website, trifaith.org, and you can offer a gift there. Or you can always do the text to give option. All of those are viable and good and acceptable, and we are so grateful for your continued support. Um, thank you. Your gifts do not go unnoticed or undervalued your incredible gift to us. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, accept our lives and our gifts to your service so that through us and through them, the world might see more clearly what it looks like to be loved and cherished by you. Amen. By these waters of life, we are made new, we are made new. By these waters of life, we are made new. Now is a heart in the Lord. Placing our hope in our God. So let us be a reflection of hope for the world. By these waters of life, we are made new. We are made new. waters of life we are made new now we are healed of our wounds cleansed from our sin by your grace so let us be your forgiveness for all of the world By these waters of life, we are made new, we are made new. By these waters of life, we are made new. Now have the lost been redeemed. 
given the gift of your peace so let us now be the gift of your peace to the world by these waters of life we are made new we are made our life in the Lord, one in the body of Christ. So let us all share your spirit and life with the world. By these waters of life, we are made new, we are made new. I got a text uh, yesterday from a friend, and he was uh, commenting on how he, Fredericksburg, he was just traveling back up from Fredericksburg, Texas, and he was saying, man, it's an ice skating rink right now. Um, and he's like, you know, it's amazing, you know, because down there they don't get a lot of ice and snow and all this, and he was saying everything was covered in ice. And he was commenting on how the uh, it was snapping some of these ancient oak trees, uh, snapping them like, like toothpicks because of the ice and the weight and everything. You know, he said it was tragic. He said that it was, you know, it was sad. It was horrible. And of course, he's right. You know, I, I totally get that. Um, that water would come in a way that could destroy, um, you know, that water could be so dangerous in this frozen form. Uh, it's a scary thing. Um, but it was scary for Noah when it made him build a boat. It was scary for Jonah who got swallowed by that whale in the sea. And Water stopped Moses from escaping Pharaoh's army. But God made a new covenant with Noah. Jonah got around to obeying God and proclaiming his message to God's people. And the Red Sea was parted. And the people of Israel passed through to safety. You know, when we read scripture, we discover that whenever God is getting ready to do something new, water seems to, to make an appearance. And so water can not only be a scary thing, but it's a life-giving thing. We, you know, we need it to live. And so, you know, when this ice melts, and the seasons will change again, a new life will come. We're reminded that by these waters of life, we were made to thrive. Many a dream has died Like a tree planted by the water We never will run dry Living water flowing through God, we thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire just to know you and to make you know we lift your name on high shine like the sun make darkness run and hide we know we were made for so much more than Oh, 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 oh,
we're digging deep to know our father's heart into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are to living water flowing through god we thirst for more of you fill our hearts and flood our souls with one Just to know you and to make you know We lift your name on high Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide We know we were made for so much more than survive we were made to thrive brothers and sisters in Christ through this act sacrament of baptism we are initiated into Christ's holy church we're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. So, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? My friends, this day, these questions are not just questions that are hypothetical ones. These are the baptismal covenant questions that we ask everyone who is baptized and which I ask you today. As you participate in the life of the church, as you participate in your life here and beyond, might you be remembered, might you remember that baptism is not just for your someday a long time ago, but it's for now. You can live into this promise that you made and that was made on your behalf every day, every moment that you are able to be more and more like Christ. So may you be transformed by water and the Spirit. May you be moved by the water and the Spirit. And may you be born again. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. So go forth with the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. Joy unspeakable, faith unsingable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsingable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy Just to know you had to make you know We lift your name on high Trying to make the sun make darkness run and hide We know 